Good morning. Welcome. My name is Bob Perito. I'm the director of the Center for Security Sector Governance here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you this morning and uh, thank you very much for braving the weather and, uh, and coming in. <clears throat> we have uh, more than 100 people who said they wanted to come and join us this morning, so we're hoping that they will be trickling in over time. For those of you that have been to our uh, security sector reform uh, events before, you'll notice we're not in our usual space today. Uh, the uh, conference level, which you see above you, uh, has been taken over this morning by uh, talks on the state and direction of the Darfur peace process. At the request of the State Department, USIP has brought together representatives of all the major armed groups in Darfur, plus U.S. officials and ambassadors, Sudan experts, members of civil society, and everyone else who has a stake in the Darfur peace process. <clears throat> and they've been conducting talks <clears throat> in these conference rooms around us. So uh, peace is being made, hopefully, even as we, uh, even as we speak. Uh, this morning, we here are, uh, are assembled to discuss the issue of police corruption. Police corruption is a universal problem. It affects countries and all parts of the world at all levels of development. Uh, it is particularly disruptive in, in situations of post-conflict states and states emerging and dealing with crisis. Um, the proof of all this is uh, just to sort of look at what's going on around us. Yesterday, uh, the British government launched an official inquiry into the involvement of the London police in the phone hijacking case of Rupert Murdoch and the World News tabloid. Um, this is something which has been going on for quite a while, but this is a new step in that process. Already uh, among the victims of this scandal has been the head of Scotland Yard. More closer to home, uh, we remember back a few years ago to what was called the Rampart scandal, which engulfed the LAPD when a group of police officers who were in the anti-gang unit engaged in all types of creative, uh, criminal activity, all sort of in the name of suppressing gang violence. And uh, our panelist here this morning, Michael Burkow, played a role in all of that, and, and we'll hear more about that later. Not as a perpetrator, <laughs> but as somebody who, uh, who put things straight. Uh, although we always wonder about Mike. <laughs> uh, an example of the impact of police corruption in, in a post-conflict environment, uh, I think we need to look no further than the, the situation in Afghanistan today. Uh, this presents an enormous challenge to the U.S.-led effort uh, to train Afghan national police. Uh, police abuses in Afghanistan have become so endemic in some places that, the Afghan, um, af that Afghan citizens have turned to the Taliban to protect them against the law enforcement agents of their own government. Um, recently, a former US, U.S. advisor to the Interior Ministry told me a, a particularly jarring story about corruption in Afghanistan. The story was that a, uh, an NGO um, had uh, brought a group of disadvantaged children uh, to the top of a hill in Kabul uh, on a windy day and had passed out uh, brand new kites for the children to fly. The, uh, the kites, which had been paid for by USAID, were barely aloft before a unit of uh, Afghan National Police arrived, uh, stole the kites, and chased off the kids, uh, confirming probably the feeling that many Afghans had that uh, their own police force is simply a bunch of thugs wearing with badges and uniforms. Um, so the problem of police corruption is universal, and uh, police scandals are highly visible. Often when they break, they're on the front pages of the newspapers and on television. <laughs> However, the solutions to the problem of police corruption are much more elusive. The efforts by donor governments, by non-governmental organizations, and by international organizations to deal with police corruption have been hampered in the past by several factors. Uh, first, corruption, particularly at high levels, is hidden by its very nature and therefore probably doesn't come to public attention until long after the fact. Corruption, as we all know, is culturally relevant. What is an illegal activity in one country may simply be a matter of a family obligation or just good manners in another country. 
And finally, police corruption is very difficult con to control in a situation where you may not have courts and prisons that function effectively. This raises two questions, which we have assembled a panel today to discuss. The first of these questions is, what is a working definition for police corruption that applies equally in all countries and at all levels of development? And the second one is, how can police corruption be controlled, particularly in situations where there is a lack of effective governance? You have the biographies of our speakers, so I will limit my introductions. The panel will speak in the order that they are introduced. Our first speaker today is David Bailey, the former dean and current distinguished professor of the School of Criminology at the State University of New York in Albany. David is the principal author of a new USIP special report, which is on the table outside on the issue of police corruption called What Can Past Scandals Teach Us About Current Challenges? Um, to David, we'll speak first. Our second speaker is Anton Soper, who is an assistant commissioner in the New Zealand uh, police force and is currently on assignment to the United Nations Police and the uh, Department of Peacekeeping Operations at the mm -hmm. UN Secretariat in New York. And we're grateful that he came all the way down from New York this morning. Uh, our third speaker will be Sanja Ivkovich, who is a professor of criminal justice at Michigan State University and the author of an extremely fine book called Fallen Blue Knights, Controlling Police Corruption. And we're very grateful to her because she already gave one speech this morning at the national conference that's going on up at the Hilton Hotel, a gathering of criminologists from all over the United States, and she managed to get into a cab and get here on time. So we're grateful for that. And last is Michael Burkow, who is the former chief of the Savannah Chatham Metro PD and deputy chief of the Los Angeles Police Department, who played a large role in cleaning up the Rampart scandal. Um, <clears throat> Michael and I go back a very long time. Um, I was responsible for sending him off in the early part of his career to both Mogadiscio in Port-au-Prince, and the fact that he still speaks to me at all always amazes me. But it's, uh, he has a, a really broad background, which includes both working in post-conflict interventions and doing uh, very high-level policing in the United States. So we're grateful that he's here. Uh, so we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, we also have an amazingly well-informed audience, and we're growing by numbers all the time here. So we look forward to an exchange question and answer period at the end of the presentations. So why don't we get started? David, the podium is all yours. Thank you very much, Bob. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I should also mention that he described me as the principal author. I would describe him as my colleague. Uh, and, and joint author on this report that we've, that, uh, that we've just published. Uh, and indeed, Bob has a way of keeping me grounded uh, with, respect, with respect to what's going on in Washington and the American government, and that's very helpful indeed. What we tried to do in this report uh, is to assess current knowledge about recommendations about solutions to police corruption and to judge the utility of that for stopping and, and reducing police corruption in the in conflicted countries, countries that are not particularly well developed, and countries that are only imperfectly democracies, uh, and this is where the U.S. is heavily engaged, as you know, and many of you in the audience are doing this kind of work, and report constantly about how you're stumbling over police corruption and what may be done about it. Now, what we're going to say to you today is, at the end, it, the conclusion that we have worked toward is the generic solutions across a police agency altogether uh, against corruption will probably fail. Uh, and I'm going to take you through our logic in doing this, and what we're going to say in the end is that to be successful in, in reducing corruption in police agencies abroad in the places that I mentioned, the places we're concerned about, it is necessary to prioritize the focus of those anti-corruption activities and to think tactically about them. And I shall explain that uh, later on at the, at the end. Now, there, the, our logic goes like this, that there are two reasons, two kind of sets of findings of, on our part uh, that have led us to this conclusion. One is that context matters, that both the forms of police corruption and the solutions suggested for it are very dependent upon the particularities of place. 
And secondly, that the standard knowledge that we bring to bear, that is we, you and I in this audience, largely a Western audience, uh, including New Zealand and so forth, uh, the, these outliers of civilization, um, <laughs> that the standard knowledge that we share about how to deal with police corruption uh, is very limited, and especially limited in its application to the places that concern us the most. Now, let me take you through those very quickly, because I only have about 15 minutes. Uh, the first about context matters. What Bob and I did was to systematically look at we cons- what we consider to be the best sources of information about the forms of corruption and recommendations for their solution. And these come of what I will describe as blue ribbon uh, panels. Um, and we canvassed the English-speaking world, 58 countries, including Israel, um, which only sometimes translates things from Hebrew into English, but nonetheless included uh, uh, Israel. What we looked at was commissions that had been established, independent of government, outside of the control of the police, whose findings were published uh, and who had a, a, a legal authority to command people to come and testify and to, and, and to collect documents. And these reports, which we're going to report to you and the findings from them, um, these reports constitute really what is the basis for the standard, our standard knowledge about police corruption, its forms, and its recommendations. And if you begin to look at the second, and if you read carefully the secondary literature on police corruption, you will find that these reports are cited again and again and again. All right. Now, on context matters, what's, what's, what's interesting here is that the forms of, of police corruption, let me show them to you, um, uh, are very contextually specific. Let me come to these. There you are. You have a look at them first. <clears throat> now, these are the forms that are reported most often uh, in these reports that I've cited. Now, what's interesting to us about this is that although these are the, the most commonly cited forms of police corruption, they only occur in about 43% of the kinds of corruption that are mentioned. In other words, there's another 60% of particular forms of corruption in particular places that aren't covered by these particular categories. So what I'm saying saying to to you is that there is not a standard kind of set of behaviors that constitute police corruption, even in the the English-speaking world whose whose reports we, we have drawn on. There is an incredible variety And that's going to lead us in the end to saying we must take into consideration the particularities. Now, the same is also true with respect to the standard recommendations uh, for uh, for reducing police corruption. Let me show you what that list looks like. Have a look. It's a longer list, and you'll be familiar with many of these. Once again, uh, what I am saying to you about these, although these are the most common suggestions that have been made in the English-speaking world for uh, reducing police corruption, these only arise in about 43 percent. They constitute only 43 percent of the total number of recommendations that I might have provided on this list. In other words, once again, about 60 percent of the suggestions that Blue Ribbon Commissions have made for reducing police corruption aren't covered by this particular list. And once again, <clears throat> why is that the case? And the answer is because where these where corruption occurs determines its form and and as a result of that and as a result of that, the recommendations also are highly context specific. That's the point that comes out of our reading of what we know about police corruption, especially in the English-speaking world. Now, let me move to the second point, and that the standard knowledge that we have, both about forms and about recommendations, um, is not only uh, limited, um, or is limited, and and there are two reasons in addition, and there are two reasons for saying that. In other words, limited in the sense of its applicability, 
to the conflicted places in the world that we are operating in and would like to do something good about. First is that these reports that I've reported to you are really, well, let me start again. In the English-speaking world, in the past century and a half, when Blue Ribbon Commissions were first done, there have been only 10 independent Blue Ribbon Commissions on police corruption. There have been 22 others on police generally. Now, when I say what I have in mind, when I say commissions on police corruption, there's the Knapp Commission, the Fitzgerald Commissions in Queensland, and so forth. Some of these you'll be familiar with, the Mullen Commission in New York, and so forth. There have been only 10 of these. The interesting part of this is that seven out of the 10 come from two countries, the United States and Australia. There is only one that's ever been done on police corruption in what we would refer to as the third world, and that's Uganda. And that was in the year 2000, done by a very competent Supreme Court justice. That's the only one. Now, there are some, so what I'm saying to you is that even our knowledge, so what I'm saying to you is this. Despite the fact that our knowledge is based upon forms of police corruption and solutions of police corruption in only a few countries, the fact is that there's even enormous variation across those reports in terms of forms and recommendations. Now, that strikes me as very interesting. The other point that I would like to make here is that we often say that the solution abroad to police corruption is to constitute blue ribbon commissions. Why aren't they more common in the English-speaking world? Why has Canada had none on corruption? Why has the UK had none on corruption? Why have you, perhaps, Ethel, had none on corruption? It seems to me that's an interesting finding in itself, that the way in which polities respond to this particular problem is by no means standard, even in our part of the world. And we must keep that in mind when we design solutions for the rest of the world. If it's rare here, it's going to be even rarer and perhaps more difficult in the rest of the world that you and I are interested in. So what I'm saying to you is our knowledge is very peculiar. And that is something that I think people should investigate, why even in our part of the world this Blue Ribbon Commission solution is not more standard. The second thing I want to say to you, and in some ways this is more important, is that our standard suggestions, our standard recommendations for policing police corruption assume conditions in the surrounding environment, political, social, and economic, that simply don't exist in the countries that you and I are concerned with today. And let me show you what that list looks like. It looks like this. These are conditions that exist in the countries from which we have good reports of corruption. Do they exist in the countries you're concerned about in Africa, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and so forth? Have a look. They don't, do they? You know, you all have extensive foreign experience. These conditions simply don't exist. But they do exist in the countries from which we think we have learned things about solving police corruption. But so exporting what we know into the places that we're concerned with is, at least on the surface, very naive. Okay. What do we do then in this dilemma where there is a huge variation in forms, huge variation in recommendations, and doubtful applicability of these recommendations to the troubled world? Bob and I think there are three things that possibly can be done. One, if context is so all important, especially the context of these conflicted places, one, you could change the context. We don't go into that because you'll all know that that nation building at a very fundamental level takes a lot of time. We don't know how to do it. And that's probably not a practical thing to suggest. 
The things that we do discuss in this report are twofold. One, we could think of triage, where you look at context where we would come to the conclusion it's absolutely hopeless here because of all of these reasons and we can't touch them. And we would give some small uh, support to those countries which are already moving well down that road, and we would try to facilitate it. And then the art of this would be to find that small group of countries that are at a tipping point where our support might move them off of one kind of column and into another. And we talk about that. Now, the problem that, and I won't go into in great detail here, is that I don't believe we have the knowledge to triage successfully and to, you know, come up with these, with these three batches of countries. So we then come out with a third suggestion, which we call bootstraps. And what bootstraps is, is changing the perspective on solving police corruption altogether. <clears throat> and it says, let's ignore the context and trying to change the context to create a favorable uh, environment for reducing police corruption. Let's turn to the police agency itself and ask what the police agency on its own might be able to do despite these kinds of circumstances. Remember this. A police organization is paramilitary, uh, and it, it runs by commands and directions, it is, and it has usually an intense system of supervision. Can that be used in order to reduce police corruption? and possibly then to uh, show how police corruption can be reduced and become a demonstration project for uh, uh, honest government more broadly. <clears throat> now, what would a bootstrap strategy <clears throat> excuse me, look like where you say to the police, we want you on your own to do something about police corruption? And we call this bootstraps, and we have six suggestions to make, and they are these. Let me say something about only two of those, and that's the first one and the third one. First, we think it is terribly important to prioritize. Do not try to solve the problem of police corruption, <clears throat> all of its forms across the entire agency, but pick out your target of opportunity. <clears throat> and what we are suggesting is find that form of corruption which is most in the face of the population and most resented. In other words, we often sometimes stumble over the fact that certain forms of corruption are rooted in culture uh, and, and people accept it as part of the way things are. But at the same time, we know in most of these countries there, there are things that the police are doing, which we can call corruption, which people detest, right? Start right there. Don't start with the culture and changing that. Start with that and see, and see if you can devise a strategy to take and reduce that form, which is causing the alienation between the police and the public government and the public more largely. And therefore, and therefore, we say, think tactically. Think about things particularly that will reduce that, per, that form of, 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 uh, of uh, corruption. And don't think, this is what we're also uh, kind of arguing against, don't think about changing the recruitment system or teaching ethics uh, in the police college, uh, or about improving s supervision generally. Think of improving s uh, uh, supervision situationally. Uh, don't think first of pay raises, although that may be part in the end of it. Don't think of generic civil society development, but the development of civil society focusing on what are the particular problems that you are prioritizing. So, the second thing is think tactically. Now, what do I mean by that? 
What I mean by that is to think about, well, let me come back to prioritization for a minute. I'll give you a couple of examples. If I wanted to devise such a strategy for India, my priority would be when people come to a police station to report a crime and sign what is called a first information report, an FIR, money should not be required, period. Start right there. It's what the Indian population hates most. Talk to them. We won't go to a police station because any service that we ask for requires the payment of money. That's true. So start right there. Eliminate that, and you would do something wonderful in terms of reorienting the public toward the police. If I were to do something in Nigeria, where might I start? I think I might start with uh, with eliminating those police checkpoints on all the major highways at about 20-kilometer intervals where people's uh, registration and licenses are checked, and, of course, backsheesh has to be paid to move on, right? Some of you have been there. There are parts of, of Africa, for example, where I think the major form of police corruption, the one at least, not in monetary terms perhaps, but at least in the face of the audience, or in the face of the public, is, is the extortion that's required of street vendors. The people who sell vegetables in these nice, you know, color, colorful pyramids of this and that, they are hit up all the time. Indians, in fact, call them mamools, a regular payment for such kind of people. Start there and see what you can do, and then come up with the tactics that will eliminate that. And, 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 and here we could talk for a very long time about what some of these tactics might look like, but you have to do it on, on the basis of that particular problem in that particular place. With respect to the Indian problem of payment for signing an FIR, what I would do, one of the things I would do is to put up a big sign in every police station. You have a right to report a crime and have that taken as an FIR without paying any money. Start right there. That sends a message both to the people who are in the police station and tells something about the people uh, who, uh, in, the, in the population who are, reporting, uh, who are reporting the crime. What we're saying here in the end, our takeaway is then, is don't think about systemic, generic solutions to the problem of police corruption in these troubled places. Uh, but prioritize first and think tactically. And this requires, as I say, extensive, up-close knowledge of those places and devising particular plans for them. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. That's all? Thanks very much, um, Bob. I just wanted to touch on a few things uh, following on from David, and just by starting that the definition uh, is so wide-ranging that it encompasses absolutely everything. Um, It's universal corruption. It's it's not just restricted to developing or non-developed countries, post-conflict or conflict uh, societies, even though they are probably more vulnerable than most. Um, and it crosses all the spectrums, public, private and political areas. Um, and depending on which country you're in, the corruption could be overt or covert, uh, and we face this challenge uh, quite often. Um, the police occupation lends itself well uh, to corruption because it provides opportunity and ability uh, to undertake, undertake some of these activities with a degree of impunity. Um, But it impacts on justice, as we all know. It adversely affects the public and has the potential to lead to a wider range of offences being committed um, right through the spectrum, from public disorder through transnational organised crime um, and murders. Um, It really is an affront to equality before the law. So we try and address these issues um, and all the tasks that we have to do. Um, the scale goes from grand to petty, if that's a way to describe it, um, from ex- accepting vast sums of money uh, through to just taking a simple coffee or a lunch as a perk, um, or just to enable the police officer to do his daily duties. Like in most uh, Asian countries where I've worked, there's insufficient fuel for the motorbike or the police car uh, to be done, and they need lunch money, so they do traffic stops, as we've heard from Bob, to get those, uh, to get petrol for the police vehicle to actually do their business. So 
It's not, in those cases, you might not say it's for personal enrichment, it's to enable the job to be done. Uh, which leads me to the second point about absolute versus relative. So in some countries where there's no tax system, um, the police pay indirectly, um, the public pay indirectly for their police services, um, just by doing those particular things. And so overt and covert are issues that we deal with all the time. In terms of the UN, we've got several um, conventions against corruption, and I'm not going to address all of them, but really we're looking at issues around prevention, criminalisation, international cooperation, and, and in, in some cases asset recovery. And that asset recovery is particularly important in developing countries um, where corruption just plunders the national wealth and impacts on the state's ability to be able to reconstruct and rehabilitate. So it has an even greater effect in those areas, as has been mentioned. Um, so we should be concerned about the seriousness of the problem because it is on a huge scale. We should be um, looking at the links between corruptions and other forms of crime, and we're pretty vigilant about that. Um, it, they impact on political stability, um, but more and more for us in the UN, it's got a transnational uh, issue or a problem for us, and, and they seem to be sometimes greater than the national issues. So to deal with it, we need to have a comprehensive and, and multidisciplinary approach, and I'll pick up later on the tactical uh, that David talks about. Um, but more and more uh, peacekeeping and peacemaking now is not about just boots on the ground and doing some monitoring. It's more about development and institution building. And these challenges of corruption impact severely on that new role that we have um, in peacemaking and trying to develop these institutions. So I just wanted then to touch on some of the triggers uh, for corruption as we see it, and particularly dealing with police. In a whole lot of areas, the low educational levels have an impact for us. And I'm talking here post-conflict countries, uh, and I'll come back to it again and again. Um, in these areas, the new police service is usually built up from ex-combatants or others um, who probably wouldn't be your first choice uh, to recruit for police. Uh, but for a whole lot of reasons, political and otherwise, uh, that's what we get. So we start from a point where it may be quite difficult um, anyway. And we talk about the lack of salaries, the lack of oversight mechanisms, and most of all, for us, it's about the police culture because that's an immovable beast almost. It, it's quite difficult to change, um, and I'm sure Mike's going to um, elaborate on those sorts of things. Again, from the UN perspective, um, issues like um, post-conflict Europe in the 90s and uh, the recent film, The Whistleblower, just really highlights the ex exploitation of those vulnerable groups, the protection of perpetrators, the blue wall of silence, and a lot of people just turning a blind eye uh, to the involvement of people across all levels of our organisation, not only police, but other, through other areas as well. So the UN, like others, aren't immune to these things. On a regional basis, um, Southeast Asia uh, in particular, where there's been uh, selection and recruitment examples um, and organised crime involvement and police misconduct um, in a large number of those <coughs> jurisdictions there and the linkages that they have to judiciary and political connections uh, aren't helpful either. Um, so corruption's always in pursuit of something. It's a means to an end. So maybe now just some comments and observations on um, trying to break down maybe the income that some police officers receive um, and able to probably survive is probably a good word. And... From experience, we've, we're pretty much based that any money that uh, some frontline police officers get, a third goes to support the family, um, a third goes to operational requirements, like trying to get the petrol and the motorbike, etc., for, for duty, 
And in a lot of countries, the other third is to pay off senior officers because you can't get into the police service um, or you can't get to be a police officer, the privilege of being a serving police officer uh, without some form of payment or other favours being um, taken into account. So there's a, a need for senior management willingness and confidence to make the required changes because there is a lot of talk about making changes but sometimes there's not the confidence uh, or the willingness to be able to make the changes required. And the challenge is to change the police culture. Um, and to be fair, some police organisations have um, identified the problem themselves and pulled back from the brink of commission of inquiries and police commissions and other things. Um, but the reality is I don't think we're learning enough from those previous inquiries and previous reports on how these are dealt with. I know they're there and we've got to think more about how we deal with that. Um, there's also the issue of political interference uh, in senior police appointments um, and we know what that leads to in terms of arrests and releases based on political party affiliations or bias. So for us in, in police and probably for us in the UN police, the change needs to be major, but we talk about incremental, um, done in a positive way and not um, necessarily in a retrospective deficient way. It's about the process that David talked about um, with beach traps, pick off some of those key target areas uh, early. And I think the relationship between frontline staff, front police staff and police leadership has a huge impact on this because sometimes they're not in sync about what needs to be done and the reasons why. Uh, so that's an area that um, we're trying to get our UN police commissioners on the ground more in sync, not only with their frontline police officers, who do cause problems on some of these missions, but also for the capacity building they're doing with the host state police uh, in that regard as well. So if we talk about domestic policing, um, most of the issues uh, during my experience have been property-related offences and sexual exploitation. And in those early days, the key drivers for that were alco <coughs> excuse me, alcohol and drugs. In international policing, that focus has changed slightly and not only does it cover human trafficking and sex exploitation, but it covers a much wider range um, than probably what each uh, national uh, individual country uh, might face. And the, one of the factors or drivers for that is the economic imbalance um, of currency that the UN footprint brings into an operation or brings into a conflict country when it goes there. We bring in a lot, a lot of US dollars on the ground. We upset the balance. Our people spend that money on uh, rest and recreation, which might take forms that uh, some people would consider breaching laws, but certainly breaching ethics. Uh, so for me, uh, that's a huge factor, that imbalance um, that a heavy UN footprint might cause. So let's talk about um, the numbers of peacekeepers, peacemakers that are currently around the world. And we currently have 18 missions uh, that we're actively working on, involving more than 90,000 troops, more than 17,000 police officers, and an undetermined number of civilians who are now part and parcel in the development area of our interventions. And... Of those um, people that we put in missions, they come from 96 what we call police contributing countries. So for those 96 countries, the values are different. So police are a values-based organisation from my perspective, um, and they probably are in your home police service. Uh, but when you come together as an international police officer in the UN, it's more a rules-based organisation than a values one, and that has impacts. Um, and as we've seen on some occasions, our people break the rules. They're not immune to that um, in some of these corrupt practices. So those missions range from Afghanistan, which have got particular problems, Iraq, Haiti, where there's a different set of problems, but still um, causing grief, 
right through to the spectrum of the Congo and latterly, um, or in the future, uh, Libya, uh, which we'll touch on later. So all those are issues for us, are challenges that make this quite difficult because all our contributing police officers who make up the UN police um, come with different sets of values and that's hard when you're trying to, to not only change a culture but develop a new one. So in particular um, in those developed countries that we talked about, commissions of inquiry, police commissions, congressional hearings, um, they're all about systemic issues which run normally parallel to criminal inquiries and for obvious reasons. Sometimes there is a criminal inquiry and these things are dealt with, but those systemic issues have to be dealt with in those other forms. Now, it's an incumbent on us to learn the lessons from all of those documents um, that David's talked about. What we do pretty well is we listen and read. What we don't do so good is do something to fix the problem. And some of that is because of that confusion that we talk about in terms of the problem's so big, how are we going to deal with it? Um, the bootstraps is one potential way that we can start dealing with those things. I also just wanted to touch on um, a gender and ethnicity in, in terms of providing positive role models when placed in leadership or influencing roles within police organisations to prevent and sometimes change behaviour after the event. Um, we're working on strategies that putting a um, woman into leadership positions uh, has been beneficial, but we've made the mistake sometimes of not putting um, some of our women there on merit and probably setting them up to fail. So we need to do more in that area um, to better utilise their skills. And currently the UN have got a global effort to increase the number of women peacekeepers, peacemakers to 20% of our contribution. Now that's a difficult challenge because most uh, uh, domestic jurisdictions only have around 15% uh, anyway, so that's a huge ask in terms of, um, of what we're trying to achieve. I um, just wanted to also touch on what the UN are doing to develop international police standards, just to give you a flavour that we're not sitting down on this and, and doing nothing, but we are working on developing new curriculums uh, well, first of all, the, the strategic doctrinal framework. What we're trying to do is get a framework for international policing. And a lot of people in this room and on this panel have been involved in that process. So we're desperate to get our own international um, standard. And it's not going to be a Rolls-Royce model, because it can't be, because there's so many different contributing countries. But we are trying very hard to get a standard that we can adhere to. So we're working on curriculum, selection processes, training guidelines... Um, latest things like serious crime support units, transnational uh, organised crime units to support um, police services in those uh, post-conflict states to try and at least target some of those key areas to prevent the bigger picture happening later. Um, and if I just made a comment uh, that we're very good, we're making very good progress in all those areas, but I think we're deficit. Uh, in, in this particular area of addressing um, police corruption, we may be just not doing enough um, and maybe it's almost like a no-go area at the moment, um, but that's just a personal opinion that I have at the moment. So the transnational organised crime impacts of, cor of corruption impacts on us hugely uh, across borders and across states. Um, the triage strategy that's been mentioned here, it, it, for us, is an evolving process. Um, and what, what we're trying to do is see what elements of that um, can best work. Um, it's like um, the new process that um, we have in Libya. Um, the UN have, are going to have a footprint in Libya and we're trying to think about all the things that we need to learn about those processes. Um, so I think you'll find when the UN uh, get involved in this process, it will be with a very light footprint. It won't be a whole lot of people on the ground. It'll be more train-the-trainer concepts, uh, <coughs> more about um, providing uh, countries, um, experts in country to assist. So that could be a completely uh, new way for the UN to be able to operate that might alleviate some of the challenges that we have, especially in this area here. Um, 
But I come back to the fact that quality limitations hugely impact on us. Um, and I've already talked about um, the 96 police contributing countries. The standard of those police officers that we sometimes get are less than the standards and skills of the police officers in the host country that we're trying to um, institution, um, strengthen their institutions and do capacity building on. Um, part of the reason for that is um, our pre-inspection standards uh, for UN selection may not have been good enough, so we're working on those processes to help. In terms of the host state, ex-combatants who come in to be part of the fledgling new police service in some cases hugely delay the incremental uh, development that police can have because they come from a whole range of backgrounds. Um, we could talk about the vetting process uh, for a long time, uh, but in some cases it just doesn't happen. Um, so we need to be conscious of those things. And finally, because I'm conscious of the time, I'd just like to, to close with um, zero tolerance versus gradual reduction on impacts. So for me, maybe zero tolerance is an aspirational goal because we not, might not be able to get there unless the political and the other triggers are addressed. So probably a gradual and more incremental um, change will bring a sustainable reduction uh, of corrupt developments, and that might be achievable. Um, and keep your eye on that police culture because that takes time to change, as I've said. So the facts appear to be simple. Our organisation, and I talk about that as the UN, needs to improve our, our collection and analysis of the scale of the problem and the impact of corrupt practices <coughs> because we're not there yet. We don't know the full extent. We don't know the individual statistics that make it up, so it makes it hard to be able to deal with. We need to strengthen our investigative practices and to develop transparent, deterrent um, mechanisms. Currently, for police behaviour in a mission, or misbehaviour or misconduct, um, mostly what happens is the person gets sent home from that mission. Um, not much follow-up is done in some cases, and next week they go on another mission. So where this relates to corruption is, we're not dealing with the problem, we're sending it away to another destination, displacing the issues. <clears throat> so these tasks require the coordination and willingness of a wide range of stakeholders, not just the police. And I'm particularly interested in David's issue here because inside police we can target key areas, there's no doubt about that, but we won't make an impact until we get all the stakeholders involved in the process, um, political included, uh, to see if we can make a difference. Thanks very much. Thank you. Sanjay, you, uh, you're up next. And before I begin, a uh, disclaimer for my fellow panelists. I'm going to use a PowerPoint presentation, and if you sit in these seats until the end of this presentation, your neck is going to hurt. So I recommend that you either move or somehow adjust so you can see the panel, the, what's on the screen. <coughs> Yeah, it is up there, but if you want to see what's on the screen, you probably need to move. Okay. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, let me start my talk. Um, the title of my presentation is Controlling Police Corruption, and it's a very wide topic, so I wanted to show you a roadmap of what I'm going to cover in my talk. So I'll just briefly introduce the topic and then tell you more about control mechanisms. What do we typically use in developed democracies? And what are the potential problems with the system that we currently use? Then I'll propose a novel approach toward police corruption and its control, and I say, well, how about if we talk, focus on uh, control functions instead of focusing on institutions themselves? And I'll give you a few examples of how this might work. And I'll, pro I'll end this talk with a few concluding remarks of what seem to be the novel approaches or the new ideas in terms of control. So as you can see on the slide, there are many stories that are making cover page news. They involve police corruption, and this is just a sample of all of these stories. Uh, the image of these blue knights who are entrusted to enforce the law is pretty much shattered when these knights have used their office for personal gain. And um, I hired the creation cartoonist to draw a few cartoons for my book, so I thought I would include a few of them to make them all lighter. 
And this one I called the birthday gift. So he was trying to portray what police corruption looks like without actually characters speaking. Okay? So as you can gather by this point, there are many different, different definitions of police corruption. And the most common one that you can find in the literature is basically saying that this is a form of police misconduct or police deviance. And it is primarily motivated by the achievement of personal gain. So we can differentiate this kind of corruption from the noble cause corruption. And indeed, policing is a occupation that provides many opportunities for corruption. It is a highly discretionary activity, a coerced activity that routinely takes place in private settings out of the supervisor's sight and before witnesses who often viewed as unreliable or lack credibility in the courtrooms. So here's another one. This guy has been blinded by uh, the gain that he's getting. Okay? So the consequences of police corruption are uh, many. And if you think about the consequences for the citizens, they lose trust in the police, but on, not only in the police, in other parts of the government as well. They are less likely to come forward when the police need some information. They are less likely to go to the police and actually make reports or uh, complain about police misconduct. Then we can talk about the effects on the police officers. The level of code of silence is going to strengthen if police corruption is uncontrolled. Police officers will develop a cynical attitude. Their respect for the supervisors and the administration in general is going to decrease. And furthermore, they are becoming more vulnerable to further erosions of integrity. And lastly, from the police administrator's perspective, the ability to deal with other problems weakens if they're not addressing police corruption issues uh, as well. So when people typically talk about uh, control, police con control of police corruption, they think about various control mechanisms. And here is a list, we can classify them into several groups. One of them would be these external mechanisms of control. In other words, mechanisms that are placed outside of the police department itself. And we can talk about legislature, courts, prosecutors, mayor, or in the case of nationalized police agencies, maybe the Minister of Interior, uh, independent commissions, citizens groups, and the media. Then we can talk about uh, internal systems of control, in other words, what exists within the police department. And here's the role of the police chief, the establishment and enforcement of official rules, uh, what has been done in recruitment and training, what role would the peers have and supervisors have a control in police misconduct or police corruption, and lastly, the internal system of control itself. So if we can post both of these sets together, we have a complex mechanism, but we are not done yet building the picture. We need to include citizen reviews in established democracies, and that would be a mixed system of control. Mixed because it is not housed within the police department, it's outside, so external, but it may have police officers as members. So instead of talking about each of these individual institutions, how about if you look at the system? Okay? Uh, first of all, the system has a potential domino effect. If one part of the system is not operating, there may be effects on other parts of the system. For example, the courts will not be able to try police officers who are engaging in corruption if the prosecutor is unwilling to bring the charges. Or investigators from the internal affairs offices within the police department will not be able to successfully investigate cases of police corruption if, on the other hand, the police chief doesn't provide adequate resources to these officers. Uh, we can also need to keep in mind that the system is set up in such a way where the responsibility is not shared and really should be shared across several institutions. And we classify these institutions based on where they belong, and we assume that they all perform the same functions. In reality, they don't. When you look at the citizen <coughs> reviews, they perform different kinds of institutions depending on which a particular uh, citizen review to look at. Okay? So the reality check, if you focus on the internal mechanisms of control, Clearly, the scandals and the investigations by these independent commissions show us very clearly that police should not be trusted to police themselves. And the same reports tell us that in the same agencies, external mechanisms of control are not working either. Okay? And furthermore, the problem with external mechanisms of control is that the focus is either too wide, in other words, we have annual reports and budgets, or too narrow, which focus on specific individual cases. Um, these mechanisms are typically not proactive. We're waiting for the incident to happen and then react. In other words, they are mostly reactive. So we have these cycles uh, where we start with a scandal, then go through an investigation, then propose some recommendations, hopefully implement them, and then 20 years down the line, we have another report, another scandal, and so on. Okay? Um, these instruments, are typically institutions, are typically not providing continuous control. Their effort is sporadic on a case-by-case -case basis. 
And last, the problems with the mixed mechanisms of control is that they focus typically on individual cases. In other words, they see the trees, they don't see the forest. Okay? And with the exception of auditors, and I'll talk more about this in a minute, uh, these mechanisms are mostly reactive as well. So if you look at this system overall, then you have the several very interesting problems. There is no joint responsibility for performing the specific control functions. In other words, no institution is responsible to investigate police misconduct, and this is a task that should be shared across several institutions. Uh, furthermore, because we have this division, external and internal mechanisms of control, police officers and police departments often feel that all of these control efforts are pushed down their way and that they may be reluctant to cooperate with external mechanisms of control. We have this piecemeal approach where each institution is focused on the task at hand and no agency has the responsibility for overseeing, coordinating and improving the whole system. And lastly, the focus is mostly reactive and thus dependent on police officers actually getting caught, processed, and punished. And also, we need to depend on the public will, whether there is going to be a scandal, whether there's going to be political pressure created to do something about this. And then we depend on the willingness of particular institutions of control to actually engage in these control efforts. Okay? So here's another cartoon. And then here we can have a novel approach. So instead of focusing on institutions and what they do, we can focus on the control functions and then talk about these uh, institutions. So we can enumerate what the necessary tasks are. And using David's approach, we can have a priority list. Okay? What do we want to do? What are the key issues we want to do? We can emphasize who is involved in this task and who shares the responsibility. Okay? We can connect the police department with other institutions. So now they're sharing this task. They have the joint uh, responsibility here. Uh, and we can also differentiate among institutions who carry the same name, like citizen reviews. We can say, well, not all citizen reviews do the same thing. And lastly, uh, but this is not the least important argument, this will allow us to notice problems sooner. Now it's what is not working with the system. And here is my wish list of things that we can be doing. These would be the ideal functions that we can do. So detect and investigate corruption and discipline officers. Monitor propensity for corruption and cultivate culture and tolerance of corruption. Establish supervision and accountability. Set official policies and enforce them. Provide resources for control. Control police departments' efforts to control corruption. Detect and investigate corruption that police department is not investigating. Improve the existing system limit opportunities for corruption, and disseminate information about corruption. And clearly, um, depending on the context, this list is may, uh, may look differently, and the priorities may be different. Here, my list is organized in a different way. The order is, the top of the list are the things that are closest to the department, that's what the department should be doing, and moving further away toward the list that more, it's more likely that external uh, control efforts should be done. Okay? So uh, let me give you two examples of how this might operate. So if you assume that we are talking about the function that's called detect and investigate the corruption that police department is not investigating. Okay? So in other words, we want to know how large the dark numbers are. Um, no institution carries this as a permanent continuous responsibility. In established democracies, we typically see that there are four different institutions that share this task. The prosecutors, the media, independent commission, and citizen groups. And some institutions, such as prosecutors, have the permanent responsibility, but it's a general responsibility, responsibility for uh, prosecuting corruption in general. Other institutions, like independent commissions, have a temporary responsibility, but the responsibility, among other things, to investigate a corruption that the police department is not investigating. And each of these players come in with its share of problems. The prosecutors potentially may be interested only in the most serious cases with solid evidence that they can bring to the courts. Independent commissions are highly dependent upon the political scandal. Is there a scandal? Is there a powerful uh, voice behind it that's actually going to push this so that we can have the commission established to, be, to begin with? They're temporary. They cannot implement their own recommendations. Then the media. The focus is sporadic. We are looking for the stories that are extreme, stories that are going to sell the paper, stories that uh, we simply don't know, may not be typical of what goes on in the police department. Uh, also, it's highly dependent on the interests of the publisher, interests of the editor and the reporters. And lastly, citizen groups, if they are the players, they may not react to police corruption at all. They actually may be tolerant of police corruption and may not have the capacity to actually <coughs> do any investigations. Or let me give you another example. 
if you have assumed that the function is to improve the police department's overall system of control, that only rarely would an institution have the responsibility to seek improvements of the overall system. In other words, the auditors in the citizen review groups would have this responsibility. In the current system, we have uh, four agencies again. The police agency, the mayor, city manager, or in the case of national, uh, nationalized police institutions, probably the minister, independent commissions, and citizen reviews who would be having this responsibility. However, this is a complex task and requires at least three steps. First of all, diagnose the problem. Second, think about some recommendations. And third, implement these recommendations. And uh, some institutions are doing only a part of this, like independent commissions. They really don't have the power to implement their recommendations. Furthermore, some institutions are in the have the task of examining the overall system, like independent commissions, whereas others, uh, citizen reviews, have the task of only focusing on a small part of what the police agency is doing. So if you really want to improve this uh, overall system of control, then we are stuck with these institutions and the problems that they are having, like the police agency. Clearly, what we know from the commission reports is that corrupt police departments will not try to improve that system of control. Okay? Independent commissions, again, are dependent on the scandal and the political form, uh, political will to be established. They're temporary, they may have great recommendations, but they're going to remain dead light on paper if nobody enforces them. And the mayor city manager may fear that if they do something about this, there's going to be perceived as political influence. They may like the resources or may they like information that something is going on in the department. And furthermore, citizen reviews, uh, the majority of them focus on the individual cases and really cannot tell you uh, how to improve the overall system of control. So in conclusion, the story of police corruption is a complex one, as you've seen, and there are many heterogeneous institutions with many different tasks there. The reality of it is that these institutions operate reactively, sporadically, in isolation, and typically with insufficient resources. And as numerous scandals demonstrate, there is plenty of room to improve the system as is. So I want to talk about quickly about three novel approaches. The first one was the early warning systems. The idea behind this is that if there are potential problems are spotted early, they can be addressed before they escalate and become serious issues. So the nature of these early warning systems is proactive and continuous, which are two key factors when you think about effective control. And they are now becoming a part of many uh, um, municipal police agencies in the United States. The second one is, uh, has something to do with the 1994 Violent Crime Control Act, and it's called the Court Injunctions or Consent Degrees that the Department of Justice um, is stepping in. And the Department of Justice now has the right to act as a plaintiff in pattern and practice lawsuits. And the caveat here is that typical cases of police corruption will not be covered by these lawsuits. So assuming that they are, then the, these consent decrees require the police departments to engage in systematic and widespread reforms of the police agency. And here we can talk about such things such as in, change the training or revise the complaint procedures, introduce the early warning systems as some of the requirements. In addition, in order for uh, the court to know this has been success successfully, uh, then there is a temporary court-appointed monitor. However, the key word here is temporary. We don't know what the effect is going to be once this monitor stops working for the court. And uh, I think that the most promising one is the series of auditors. And when you look at the literature on citizen reviews, you can uh, see that there are four different types of citizen reviews. And auditors consist of only a very small percentage of all of the citizen reviews, about 3%, according to the latest survey. Um, the, What's different with auditors and other citizen complaints is that auditors do not investigate individual complaints. In other words, they don't look at the individual trees. They focus on the overall system of control. They look at the forest. Okay? And they focus on the big picture and try to provide feedback to the police departments. So if the police departments have the capacity to learn new things, here's the opportunity. They're going to be provided with some evidence on what to do. And let me just... Um, close my talk, but saying that what we know in the academic literature about which of these mechanisms are effective, and Sam Walker is the leading authority on citizen reviews, he's arguing that the San Jose Police Auditor and the Special Counsel to the Los Angeles Community Sheriff's Department are viewed as some of the best auditors that we have in the country. So stop here. Thank you very much, Sanja. Michael, you're batting clean up. 
You have 15 minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, a couple preliminary comments. First of all, my title is wrong. I've changed uh, titles, same company. I work for a private company now. I'm the president of the Kroll Security Group, which has given me the opportunity to even work in more and different stranger places than Bob used to send me. Um, second thing is, uh, Bob and David misled me purposely in advance. I always use PowerPoints. They sent me a, a written notice that said no PowerPoints. Um, clearly, I've been misled in that regard. So um, I'm going to just speak uh, a number of observations. And it's funny because the, the last speaker I've never met before, and I confess to not having read her book but some articles, I almost want to do another panel that would go back to the old point-counterpoint because I couldn't more violently disagree with a number of her conclusions. Um, I think that police departments are incredibly capable of reforming themselves, and I think there are a wide variety of factors that can bring that into play. And I could give specific examples. Uh, I was... I was particularly struck by the one slide that said police departments really don't look at the problem, identify the problem, do the diagnosis, do the recommendations, and then implement it. Well, I can give you a specific example from the LAPD where we had a very real problem with the way in which we investigated officer-involved shootings. And we diagnosed the problem. We spent a lot of time figuring out what happened, why it was going, what were our problems. We then developed a, 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 a very specific action plan to fix it, which resulted in the creation of a new unit called Force Investigation Division, about 50 detectives that ended up coming to work for me. Um, and I spent four years running those investigations that have really become the national model for how to investigate officer-involved shootings. So I think there's a, there's a lot of things that would be rich for a further discussion. Um, that said, I really was asked to react to David and Bob's paper and sort of think about this in, in post-conflict environments. I've worked in six post-conflict countries uh, on policing issues and worked in about 30 other foreign countries on police issues. Uh, the first thing that strikes me is definitions and language really matter. Um, and I struggle with this. We keep referring to corruption. Corruption has a very specific definition. I think what we're really talking about here is police misconduct, which incorporates corruption in the definition. And I, I, I think that's important. Um, I also think... Uh, that we need to go back to, and this was something that Sanja put up, and I happen to be a huge believer in it, I think that David Carter's work on distinguishing between abuse of authority and occupational deviance is incredibly relevant when you think about how to organize your police control mechanisms. They are very different motivators. They are very different acts. They have very different types of controls that you must use. I think that abusive authority and occupational deviance framework can be incredibly useful as we work in specific countries and look at what's going on. In a very shorthand way, abusive authority cases involve those actions where you can at least make an argument the police officer is trying to achieve a legitimate government objective, a legitimate police objective. So when you get into an excessive force case, it's not a corruption case. It, the police officer isn't getting a personal benefit 99.9% .9 of the time. The police officer is, you know, end of a car chase, uses excessive force. Extrajudicial killing, arguably there's some kind of a governmental or a police goal, as opposed to occupational deviance where the police officer is trying to get some kind of a personal uh, benefit. And I think it's, it's really important to think about those the definitions and also the context. Um, two other definitions that I think are incredibly relevant when we talk about police. What we're talking about is controlling behavior. That's what police discipline, that's what police internal affairs, that's what it's all about. How do I get police officers to behave in a way that I'd like them to behave? And when you're thinking about the control mechanism, you have to step back and look at the misconducts you're addressing. And a, a, another key framework for this is, is it malfeasance? Did the officer intentionally decide to commit an improper act? Or is it misfeasance? Is the officer trying to do something that's okay, but they did it badly? 
So I go to arrest David Bailey, and I can legitimately arrest David Bailey, and I improperly use force, or I improperly search something. I'm not doing that consciously. That's a misfeasance versus a malfeasance. On the other hand, if I go to make a false case, or I'm trying to frame someone, or I'm trying to steal something, that's a malfeasance. And I've intentionally, consciously chosen to violate the rules. And those require different kinds of strategies inside the department. I remember, I'm, I'm an old guy now, and I remember when I first started in the police force, you know, and I worked midnights, you know, and you'd come to work and you'd work all night. Um, there were, you know, I don't care who you are, but sometimes at 5 o'clock in the morning, it's kind of hard driving down the road to stay awake. You can drink as much coffee as you want. It gets hard. Well, on those occasions where I pulled over before I ran into something, um, is that misconduct, malfeasance, what's happening? Versus some of my colleagues who came to work with an alarm clock and a pillow, backed the car into a garage, closed the garage door, set the alarm clock, climbed in the back seat. They've consciously made a decision to engage in misconduct. So we, we need to think about the framework. I think the context, which everyone here has said, matters absolutely. It matters in the type of misconduct. It matters in the reform strategy. The, the issues that arise are very different, and I don't care if you're talking about Afghanistan, Somalia, or the U.S. The issues in New York are radically different than the issues in Los Angeles. Do we have some overlap? Absolutely. In New York, they had many, many more issues, cultural and context issues, around thefts, around malfeasance, than in L.A., where our issues were primarily around abuse of authority. We had a much bigger issue around uh, force, excessive force, the way we interacted with the public than the New York did. You know, the simplest way to think about the NYPD, you know, you've, you've seen NYPD officers engage in arguments with the public, right? What are you doing? No, get off the side. You know, and I would use some more colorful language um, generally in those discussions. In Los Angeles, we practiced the Joe Friday School, right? Just the facts, ma'am, sit over here, sit on the curb. It's a much more, it's a harder style, but we don't engage, and the misconduct that comes out of it is somewhat different. Um, I think that a key aspect of this context is, I would put it quite simply, you get the police force you deserve. The police force that you ultimately get is very much a function of the politics and the community and the country engagement. So if the, if the country or the community is deeply engaged and committed and wants a good police force, you're much more likely to have a good police force. If the country, the community, the city, whatever you want, isn't and doesn't want it and starves it or does, starves it for resources or doesn't pay attention or demands improper conduct of it, you know, you get what you deserve. If you go back to the roots of the LAPD culture, um, the LAPD culture was very much driven by three realities. Small police force. Well, who made that decision? How much money did we get? How, how many cops were we allowed to have? Small police force. Violent community. We had a lot of crime issues. We had a real contextual violence problem with gangs and drugs and other real issues. And third, huge geographic area. So the culture that grew up in the LAPD, which was around officer safety, arose from a factor of you knew when you showed up at a scene, you were going to be by yourself for an extended period of time. And that drove the tactics, and the tactics drove the police interaction with the public, and that drove the allegations of misconduct. So, again, the context is critically important. Um, I don't think enough has been said about sort of this idea of the government and, and the police being part of the criminal justice system. Um, I, I really think that we need to, you know, we should have learned this from our interventions. You've got to have courts and you've got to have prisons. Uh, I can remember getting to Somalia and we were kind of, you know, that we started arresting people and we said, oh, what do we do with them? And, you know, that's when the 40-foot shipping connex became a prison. Um, I can also tell you, having been deployed to a bunch of these places as a, a a detailee to the Department of Justice, when I said to the Department of Justice, hey, uh, I need some prison guys because I'm a cop. I don't do prisons. Oh, no, no, no. Prisons are bad. Uh, we don't touch those. You go down there and fix the police. Well, I, I think we're going to arrest some people then. Um, no, no, we'll, we'll get to that, you know. And so there's this ignorance of this system. 
Um, I'm hopeful that the government is moving in a more comprehensive way to address this as a system, but the failure to address it as a system leads to some of these misconduct issues and corruption issues. Um, uh, and, and a great example of that, by the way, of this failure to address these issues is extrajudicial killings. I've been in a lot of places where extrajudicial killings are rather common. Um, my experience is that almost always extrajudicial killings arise as a police response to a failure to effectively prosecute bad guys. So without naming some of the countries I've worked in, um, one particular country, they would, the police would go out and arrest someone for murder. It's a country that under their legal system doesn't allow plea bargaining. The person would go to prison. They'd be sitting there for a couple of years. And over the course of the couple of years, witnesses would be intimidated, witnesses would be murdered, and lo and behold, the case would evaporate and the person would be released from jail. When they get out, they commit another murder, and the cycle repeats itself. Well, after the fourth or fifth time, the police make a judgment. Hey, this is a really bad guy, and we're not getting him through the prosecution system, so we'll just handle it ourselves. And if you look, the, the, probably the largest example of it is if you look at India, where they call them encounter killings. Um, and, you know, they got people that have done 100 encounter killings. Um, you know, the scale can be different, but the concepts are the same. The court systems in India are backlog. I don't know, David, they were telling us 10 and 20 years cases are pending. So what happens is the police jump in, engage in misconduct, serious misconduct, because of a failure of the criminal justice system. Context really matters. Third point, police misconduct is not static. It changes as societies and as the context changes. Um, if you were to interview Frank Serpico in New York City in 1970, he would have felt as helpless about police corruption and police misconduct as any police officer in Hyderabad, India, feels today. Yet that reality of New York City in 1970 is gone. That idea of systemic police corruption, the bag man going around picking up the payments, payments being made, that's really gone by and large from U.S. policing. And so the real learning point is, where did that occur? How are the triggers? What are the things that we did that caused that kind of a change? I would argue to the LAPD in 2002 and the LAPD of today are radically different organizations in terms of police misconduct. Why? What are the mechanisms that drove that? Um, I completely, I'm in violent agreement with uh, David and Bob's comment about high and low-level corruption and focusing on low-level corruption. <laughs> the low-level corruption is much more harmful to the rule of law. Um, it absolutely undermines respect for government. And by the way, it is not intractable. I repeatedly hear people say, oh, you know, we can't get the cops away from taking traffic bribes. Or It is not intractable. There are lots of different strategies, again, depending on the context. Peru, fascinating. If you go to Peru, uh, most of the traffic officers for the police department are females. They decided that females were less susceptible to corruption, so they put females in all the traffic assignments. Now, I don't think it's ever been systematically evaluated. It's kind of an interesting concept. Chile, the Carabinero have a phenomenal, I'm, I'm working in Chile, I've been spent a lot of time in Chile, probably five months this year in Chile total. The Carabinero have uh, almost no history of corruption. Um, very, very low, low levels of corruption. Why is that? Well, they've put in place a series of controls and a series of mechanisms and a series of behaviors that inhibit some things that where they're at today. They inhibit some human interaction but they have a profound impact on the Carabinero culture. So, for example, I'm out riding along in a lovely little community called La Plintana. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, and I said to the guys I'm with, can we stop and get a cup of coffee? Um, and they said, uh, you know, there's a gas station. I'll buy. Let's stop. And they said, oh, no, no, we're working. We're not allowed to have any interaction with a business while we're working. And it's, it's one of those rules that was an outgrowth of how do we prevent corruption. So we had to go back to a little base and drink Nescafe. Um, uh, the efforts to reduce police corruption have got to be tailored. I completely agree. The who, what, why, where, and how are absolutely critical. You have to look for the point of compromise. Uh, I was in a former Soviet uh, satellite state uh, earlier this year 
doing some training, and the police colonel who was detailed to drive me around had a beautiful new Range Rover. So we're driving around, and I'm talking to the guy, and uh, I had figured out that his official salary was $14,000 a year, and I asked him about his Range Rover, and he explained he loved it, and he was very proud of it, and it cost him $100,000. Um, where's the point of compromise that this colonel who's running a training institution is getting corrupt money? I want to identify the point of compromise, and I want to focus my police reform mechanisms on, a, on, on hindering that point of compromise. That's where I want to attack it. So we've got to tailor our efforts to the particular issues. Um, the change uh, comes from the inside. Police departments absolutely have the ability to change. Um, can change, and I think we've got to be we've got to have some clarity about external uh, oversight. Um, and actually, Sanjay put up auditors, um, auditors, inspector generals, those kinds of things. Let's let's separate this. Investigate. There's a line in David and Bob's report that says investigate and monitor. I want to say don't investigate, monitor, audit, report. I think when we get in, wrapped around the axle around civilian review is when you get into them investigating. And if you look at the history of it, going back to Eileen Luna, who was the first police oversight in the United States in Berkeley, California, they got wrapped around the axle hugely and had much less impact because they were investigating individual cases rather than reporting on trends and issues. I completely agree that Merrick Bob's work at Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department has been groundbreaking and much more powerful and much more transformational. Um, uh, so I think there's growing evidence that auditing works best. I'll also tell you, I think it's insane some of the uh, independent processes we've gone to, and I will name this one. Um, I think one of the worst examples is our good friends in the United Kingdom who've created something called the Independent Police Complaints Commission. Um, I'm the chief of police of a, of a force in England. I don't have authority for the disciplinary uh, of my police force. So I'm not responsible for investigating or managing or controlling or disciplining. It goes to this independent body. Well, if we have a scandal, don't come to me. I'm going to send you to go see the IC, uh, IPCC. I th I've been a chief of police in four different cities. Being responsible for discipline is not easy, but it is a critical, essential element of running an organization. I don't know of another organization or another professional body that doesn't have the leaders responsible for the discipline of their own employees. Crazy that we do that. Um, in terms of this idea of triage, the triage idea as framed, at least as I understood it, talks about who gets the aid, not what the aid is. And I think we've really got to talk about what are we trying to do and what do we give aid for. The reality is that most of the U.S. aid has absolutely nothing to do with capacity building. Um, our biggest police programs, and I can go back how, however you want to go, um, have really revolved around military exit strategies. Panama, Haiti, Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan. The police programs have all been about build something up, get the military out of there, and we've ignored much that we know about building police forces and capacity building. I could tell stories for a couple of days. I'll just tell one very quickly because I'm getting the time notice, which I knew, I knew I'd get squeezed. Um, <laughs> John Buchanan worked with me in Haiti back in 1993. John Buchanan was part of a small team that was designing the framework of the Haitian police. We were doing focus group meetings. We were doing studies. We were thinking about how to structure the police. Meanwhile, I got General Meade of the 10th Mountain Division and Colonel Mike Dallas, who happens to be a guy I respected very much, banging on me, saying, where's the t table of organization and equipment for the Haitian police? Sign it up. Give me a napkin. I can draw it for you. Well, no, no, no. We're trying to figure out what works best in the Haitian context. I know, we've got to get these guys stood up. I've got to get back to Fort Drum. You know, come on. Uh, so you, we really have a problem. And I think... The other thing that happened is what's happened with our foreign assistance to police forces has dramatically shifted. It's gone from capacity building to operationally focused on U.S. interests. If you look at what the U.S. government is spending on 
overseas police investment. It's DEA with vetted DEA units. It's the marshal service with how do we catch fugitives. It's, you know, we're, we're running operations overseas that benefit us that are not about building the capacity of the home state. We have one agency, ISATAP, that has that capacity-building mission, which, by the way, doesn't even have a line budget, unless that's changed in the last year. Okay. So I think we do have a very real body of knowledge about what works. Um, I think we, we absolutely have, beyond the commissions, um, one of the things that we did at LAPD was we, we had something called the Major City Chiefs Internal Affairs Group. We got together the 10 police departments from around the country um, and developed some pretty good ideas about internal affairs. I think, I think of it more as I'm a doctor. I come in. I look at the situation. I analyze the situation. I investigate what the issues are. And then I pull out my prescription pad, and I choose from a variety of mechanisms that I then target to try and solve those particular problems. Um, I would make one cautionary remark at the end. We all seem to have national amnesia. Um, we forget key lessons we have learned. And so we keep doing the same mistakes over and over again. Um, there were some comments here about prior combatants. There were comments here about structuring new police forces and some other things. We have done all of these things in the past. We know what works and what doesn't, and yet we continually forget what we've done in the past. Um, I was talking to Rachel Neal about El Salvador before this. El Salvador was a very specific formula, 20% in the new police from the guerrillas, 20% from the government, 60% never from the police force. Huge USAID uh, demobilization program around former police and former guerrillas. It's the only place I know that we've ever done that. And it worked okay with some problems, but it had real possibilities, but we forget about it. Thank you. That's the one thing about asking Michael to speak. It, he's very reticent to tell you what he really thinks about things. And, <laughs> but we try to draw him out, you know, and I think maybe, you know, in, over time, his real thoughts on things will, will emerge. Uh, John Buchanan sitting over here, the poor fellow that Michael sent out to do all this, this hard work. Uh, anyway, we now want to move into the uh, second part of our program. We have some, some time left. Uh, I want to invite uh, the audience to ask questions or make comments. The way we do this, for those of you that may not have been here before, is we ask people to come down. There are microphones on each side of the hall. Uh, and we ask you to queue up and, and ask your questions. We ask you to do this because we're capturing all this uh, on videotape and, and audio, and uh, the transcript of this will, will go onto our website in a couple of weeks. So um, while people are thinking of their questions and making their way down to the front to ask their questions, I have a question. Um, I'm going to uh, exercise my uh, prerogatives here as the chair. I want to ask each of the panel members to... Uh, to talk about an instance where there was police corruption and it was cleaned up and then give us an idea of why this happened. And I will model this uh, by saying that um, USIP has a program called Justice and Security Dialogues, which we started in Nepal and we now do in several countries, where we began dialogues between the police and civil society um, members of the police talking to members of civil society, people that normally wouldn't speak to each other. Uh, and once those dialogues got started, we invited in local government um, without doing anything more than just getting people to talk to one another about their common concerns. The performance of the police improved. What seemed to be happening is the police were really reluctant to misbehave and then have to go back and face their their newfound friends, their fellow citizens uh, in these in these dialogues. So with that as a model, David, you want to. Do the first one? Yeah, I think the <coughs> most impressive case I know is Queensland, Australia, after 1989 and up to now. Um, they had a terrible situation, and they uh, established a, an independent commission to look at it called the Fitzgerald Commission. Uh, it published, he published his report in 1989. As a result of that, what they did was to set up an independent body to supervise the police uh, with investigating power, uh, Michael. And in fact, the uh, the premier of the state and the uh, the the chief commissioner of the uh, Queensland Police ultimately went to jail 
both of them before that were sure this and sure that, and so two sures went to jail, a highly profile. And the key to this, however, was to give, because frankly the Queensland police and the political establishment were incapable. They were so intermeshed in misbehavior that it was, that Queensland really decided that they can't do it themselves. And so an independent body by statute was established to investigate, to clean house, and then to monitor on a permanent basis the behavior of the Queensland police. And it has been a notable achievement. That's all. Thanks. My one will actually be on Indonesia, where there's 300,000 police officers in the organisation there, and the issue they had was selection and recruitment processes which were less than optimal, involved a percentage of money having to be paid to become a police officer. If you were a political or the son of a general, you were automatically granted entry into the process. They realised they had a problem. They worked with the international community and developed a system that was transparent and open. And for the last four years now, their selection processes have been run for the first two years with international scrutiny and now on their own, and it appears to have made a significant difference. Thank you. Sanja. I think that the best example for me would be the Michael Dowd case and what happened in New York in the early 1990s with the Mullen Commission. And I would say, well, the arrest by the other police agency, not the NYPD, the scandal that broke out and this cycle where we're starting with the political push for the mayor to do something, the establishment of the independent commission, the people who are appointed to be on the commission or who were advisors for the commission who had great ideas on how to reform the department and the implementation of some of these recommendations, not all of them, but some of them. And I can give another example of how difficult it is to deal with the corruption at the highest level of the police organization. So, for example, in South Africa, they're in the transition period right now, and it's the 17th year of the post-apartheid regime. And the last two commissioners have both been charged with corruption. The first one, Jackie Salaby, was the president of the Interpol at the time. And he was last year convicted of corruption and sentenced to 15 years of imprisonment. And his successor, Becky Selleby, sorry, Becky Selleby, uh, has been uh, suspended in October of this year for, again, serious charges of corruption. So we don't know what's going to happen. But the problem is, how do you get to these people? And in both of these uh, cases, the media broke out the story. So we have the important role of the independent media who actually went and investigated these cases. So I don't know what's going to happen, what the solution is going to be. Michael. Um, I do see a very simple one is complaints, the taking of complaints. This is an issue in every police department in America, taking of uh, citizen complaints, uh, which is an absolutely essential element. David's got a great tagline about it. You know, the police have to be responsive to the disorganized public, and part of that involves the taking of citizen complaints. In L.A., that was a perennial issue, and by a variety of efforts, including um, very clear policy, very clear training, Backed up by undercover sting operations, our people taking complaints completely changed the uh, organizational culture to the fact that everybody was going to take a complaint when somebody made a complaint of police misconduct. Thanks very much. Um, I re, um, open and reiterate my invitation for people to come to the mics and ask questions. And uh, we'll start over here. Please, uh, our, uh, our custom here is for you to uh, give us your name and affiliation. And uh, please. Hi. Thank you all for your um, presentations. Um, my name is Alexander. I'm from the Department of State. And I wanted to ask about leadership. I think we all can agree that it's important. I think we all can agree that both here and in the developing world, there are levels of leadership that, that differ. There are people who are very strong who get the goal of policing and people who are more interested in sort of personal benefit. And I'm curious what you think that foreign assistance can do to sort of better empower these good leaders who get policing and sort of not necessarily marginalize but sort of sidestep those that are trying to co-opt it for their own goals. Okay. And Michael, you want to start? Well, I think there's a this is a this is a tough one because leadership is critical to making successful changes. But police organizations tend to be too leader-centric. 
And so I'm very hesitant, particularly in the foreign environment, to try and identify a leader and then train them. I've been on too many of these missions where, you know, we pick our handpicked guy, we fly him to the States, we tour him around, they go back, and, you know, within six months they're either transferred to a different assignment than we envisioned or they're fired or doing something else. So I, I, I think we have to be extremely careful. It's, um, to me, I think our foreign assistance needs to focus more on the structures uh, and the organizational capacity initially, rather than any one leader. Um, and I think what we have to do is identify ways to develop crops of leaders rather than one. The U.S. policing world, the Western policing world, remains incredibly leadership-centric. I could talk to you about what police departments are up today in the United States. It would all be based on who's the chief today. If you talk to me about what's the greatest hospital in the United States, you know, you'll talk to me about Boston Mass. You'll talk to me about some hospital in San Diego. Nobody can name who's the head of it. Um, We don't have the equivalent of teaching hospitals and police. And I think what we really need to focus on is organizational capacity before we get to leadership. Thanks very much. I'll take another question. My name is Martina Vandenberg. I'm an attorney here in Washington, D.C. in private practice, and I'm the author of the Human Rights Watch report, uh, Hopes Betrayed Trafficking of Women to Bosnia and Herzegovina for Forced Prostitution in the Post-Conflict Period. And my question is for Mr. Soper. Um, The question concerns the role of impunity. Uh, Prince Zaid came out with a very important report several years ago discussing crimes committed by U.N. personnel, U.N. civilians, and peace keepers. His focus was largely on sexual exploitation and abuse, but I think this goes much farther across the board to other issues of misconduct. You mentioned in your remarks that it is still a problem that people are simply sent home and then there's no follow-up. And I wondered if you could uh, comment on that further and discuss what UNDPAKO is doing to try and end impunity. Thanks very much. Thanks. As a police officer, these are very real issues that we have to combat all the time. I think from the 1990s, when we started to be aware that these issues occurred, we've we've put in place mechanisms like oversight committees, uh, our own OIOS, our um, independent investigation uh, category, but we still struggle with the people making a difference. The evidence is sometimes difficult to establish um, in these peacekeeping missions. The deployments are sometimes so short, between six and 12 months, that the issue may not even come to light in that time. So that makes it difficult to be able to deal with as well. Um, But it comes back to the leadership problem uh, that we just discussed. Um, Sometimes the leadership, not only in UN missions, but also in the host state, isn't strong enough to be able to make the hard decisions as to how to do it. But you need evidence first. Sometimes we haven't got that. Um, We are building up the curriculum and the doctrinal framework, trying to increase the value base of the organisation to lessen uh, the possibility that these things can happen. But I would have to say we're making progress, but we've still got a long way to go. The sexual and gender-based violence in particular, the, um, the... the curriculum and the training standards and the guidelines that were built up around that are just beginning to be implemented effectively now. So I suspect in the future we're going to make progress. Um, as a practitioner, I don't think we're anywhere near where we need to be at this stage. Thanks very much. We'll take another question. Peter. Uh, Peter Gantz, Office of Transnational Issues. Um, thank you very much. It's been a great discussion. Uh, I wanted to... It, and a lot of the examples that were discussed are from this country. So one of the things that occurred to me as a question is, we lack a national police force. Is there a dynamic that comes into play with that in terms of trying to figure out how to address um, police corruption and, or I think Michael's right, police misconduct? Um, and is there an impediment for us because we lack an understanding of that dynamic on a basis. Yeah, I'd like to ask David and Michael and Sanja to talk about it because they come at it from different perspectives. David? Well, yes, yes and no. Um, it depends on who... 
It depends on how we draw on the expertise in policing in the United States and project it abroad. Um, I mean, I don't see any reason in principle why a national police force uh, could not give very practical advice about how you clean up a corrupt police unit or department. I don't no problem. I think the French may know a lot about that. And they're centralized. The problem tends to be in the United States that the federal the federal police, who, who are of course employed by the agencies that we, that uh, the federal agencies, and we often rely on them wholly abroad are not full, what we call first full-service police agencies. Absolutely. And so they're not apt to know less about that, that boundary of interaction between the public a- and the police. And the people who know most about that are at state and local levels. And we have to have, and I think we all recognize this, we have to have a way of drawing on the considerable expertise that, that Michael has, has, has exemplified today. We need to draw upon that and project that abroad in order to, I think, be more effective. If we're talking about changing behavior of how police interact with with the public, and I think that's the key to what we're talking about, whether we're talking about misbehavior in general or whether we're talking about technical corruption. And I say the people who know most about rooting that out, I think, are at state and local levels. They've had most of the experience, which isn't to say, let me, let me be very careful about this, which isn't to say that people in the Marshal Service and DEA and, and, and the FBI have not had some experience of that, both at home huh, and and abroad. But I would say that we need to, 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 to draw more, more widely, uh, upon the expertise that's available in the United States. In other words, we can overcome this in the United States. And I certainly wouldn't ever discriminate against a country that has a national police force by saying that they don't have the expertise that's required. Thanks, Mike. Or Sajan, do you want to go? I think that one of the problems of these legal experts or that expertise that is provided to different countries is the, we need to be very careful as to how the system looks like because what we're proposing may not fit the system. And when you look at what was happening in Germany at the end of World War II, each of the countries, sorry, <clears throat> the, the allies brought their own style of policing. And in the end, Germans didn't like either of them. Germans preferred their own style of policing. So we need to be very careful what we are bringing and how we are doing that. So that would be one of my concerns. And secondly, that um, we also bring, send the people who know what they're doing and who are people of high integrity. And in the post-conflict periods, like what was happening in Bosnia, there are some accusations of the UN troops actually being involved in the human rights violations, in corruption, and so on themselves. So these are not the people who should be training the police officers. So that's one of the concerns. And I don't think to what degree we actually have some process established that we are trying to determine who should go personally into such uh, endeavors. Michael. I think it's a mix of a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think we don't have a national police force which a- operates to our detriment in the international environment. The people that tend to get overseas are from s- federal specialized agencies. And they are, f- as David said, they are fundamentally different than, than what is policing in most places. Most of the countries that I go to, what it most resembles is, you know, the Michigan State Police or the New York State Police. Somebody who's doing a little bit of urban policing, a little bit of traffic policing, a little bit of rural policing. Uh, they're responding to calls and they're investigating crimes. But the people that we tend to deploy are from specialty agencies that don't run dispatch centers, that don't respond to uh, the disorganized public. So we have a problem. I think the debate that's going on worldwide is more about it's less about national police forces, although depending on the country, that can certainly be the issue. The Netherlands is now combining their 23 police forces into one. Um, but I think it's more about um, uh, it's more about how big does a police department need to be to effectively manage incidents. And I think there's been a lot of discussion around that, and it's a discussion that we've not had in the United States. So I think it inhibits us from growth. We, we turn to the specialized agencies that don't do policing to guide and lead and, you know, sort of manage a lot of core policing functions. We don't have the equivalent that the UK has of the National Police Improvement Agency. And the last point I would make is the people that we tend to export and that tend to do a lot of the policing stuff, I mean, I could talk about the, the CivPol contracts again for quite a while with Pretty negative. I'd, I'd be hard pressed not to give my opinion, which Bob Bob you know, actually created the Dyncourt concept. 
but but um, but but um, we we tend to rely on the military, and the military is not the police. I'm very respectful of people in the military. I seem to remember years ago in Quantico learning that the goal of the military to close with the enemy and destroy with overwhelming force. Um, that's radically different than what I learned after that in the police academy. And I think we, we confuse those two issues, and the people that we have doing these missions overseas, <coughs> they're different skill sets. <coughs> what Michael was referring to is that um, I was the person at the Department of State that organized the first U.S. police contingent that ever went to a post-conflict uh, intervention. This was uh, in Haiti. And um, we realized uh, that at that point that we didn't have a national police force. Uh, no other country in the world would send police unless there was an American contingent. Uh, we looked around and we needed uh, policemen almost automatically and so we hired the DynCorp Corporation. Um, and we and they found 50 guys who maybe had been police sometime in their lives. Many were mall guards. <laughs> About half of them had to be sent home in the first week because they had problems of, in their past. But, um, you know, that was the way it started. So Michael's never let me forget that. But yeah. so we have one more question. We'll take that, and then we'll uh, give the panel uh, an opportunity to make final remarks, and, and then we'll close. Because please, thank you for your patience. Thanks. My name is Dan Kleberg. I'm from the uh, Marine Corps Center for Regular Warfare. And uh, my question is for the panel. Uh, have any of you had the opportunity to read the Army Marine Corps counterinsurgency manual? And if so, um, do you think it adequately addresses the the importance of building law enforcement capacity? I'll give that to David because he actually has, and he, we together have written a book about it. So. Bob and I wrote We've been waiting. a book about actually, this. Actually, we so. planted that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and the, the answer is we have read it, and no, it doesn't. Um, I mean, it, it, philosophically, it's right. It talks about the importance of doing this in, in, in the Petraeus vision of counterinsurgency, but it doesn't say a word about how to do it and who's to manage it, and that's the problem. And so that there was a follow-on that needed to, be, needed to be done, which is to say how do we, how do you, you know, it, to simplify it. If, if you say that the, the, the key to the, uh, to the strategy there is uh, clear, hold, and build, um, right, um, what, what was never talked about, was how you transition from stage one, which is clearing, to the holding, which is a combined operation between uh, indigenous police and military and foreign police and military. And then last, which is build, which is primarily done by the local police and the local military and, 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 and is based upon the necessity of creating good governance. And that simply isn't, that isn't, hasn't been filled in tactically, and it needs to be. And that's what our brilliant book does. <laughs> uh, the, the book, for those of you that may not know, is called Police in War, and uh, it's available on Amazon.com, among other places. Um, <laughs> this is shameless, I know, but what can I say? Uh, having brought Michael into this process, he'll probably arrest me at the end of the meeting for violating some regulation I'm not aware of. And Bob, uh, I ought to say, in the title of that book is The Police in War. I mean, Bob. Bob, well, push the book. Push the book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Sanja? You heard of thing, Sanja? Sanja. No, okay. Anyway, no, um, no. what I want to do is give the panel uh, one last chance to make a comment, uh, and then, then we'll close for the morning. Uh, let's start with Michael. Um, I think that uh, it's for those of us who've been involved in police assistance, foreign police assistance for some period of time. It's been a mission of great frustration. Um, it should be tremendously rewarding, and it can be in limited circumstances, but I think overall uh, my experience has been one of uh, opportunity lost rather than opportunity grabbed. Uh, and I, I just, I, I think we have the collective knowledge and wisdom after doing this for a long period of time now. If you, if you want to pick the post- uh, USAID effort, which, you know, was in the 70, 60s and 70s and then ended. We had a gap from, what, 74 through 86. So if you go to 86, if you use 86 as a starting point of modern U.S. police assistance, I think we we know what we need to do. We just have never gotten our act together. And so uh, the, the challenge, I think, would be to really 
uh, get organized in the, particularly in the U.S. federal government and in our agencies that provide, you know, the State Department and others, uh, Department of Justice, and really organize around what we know works and organize our strategies around that. And let's have some clarity about it. We're spending a lot of money. It's incredibly disorganized and disconnected and not clear about what our objectives are. So I, I think there is a lot that we can do on the international stage. I think we have largely failed to be as effective as we could be. And I personally believe that if we focus on effective capacity building, we would have an incredibly positive effect on the operational U.S. issues. Thanks a lot. Sanja. I think that I would emphasize the need to learn what really goes on in the country or in the police agency that you are focusing on. I think this contextual element <clears> is really important because it's going to vary dramatically from one place to another. And what we find that may be working in the United States in some agencies may not may completely fail in some of the other agencies. And uh, when we do our police integrity research, we do have a questionnaire that we use to survey police officers simply to see where we are. And then based on the recommendations, we can move forward and say, these are the issues we want to address. We want to deal with the code of silence, the code of silence in particular, the issues that relate, for example, with uh, taking money from the motorists who have been stopped speeding. So it's important to know what you want to do and then do the list, the, your priority list of functions that you want to follow. But that should be based highly on what you know about the country, what you know about the needs and the problems there. Thanks very much. Ethel. Just uh, really wanted to finish with police are unique, and we try to talk now about police service rather than police force, just to bring that change process about more effectively. And following on from Mike's comments, we have the ability and we've got the skills to operate <clears throat> in this new environment that we find ourselves in with sound reform and um, restructuring techniques. We do have them and we're getting better at them. But we're constrained by military and political short-term imperatives might be the best way to describe it, uh, which prevent us from being as effective as we can. If we're allowed to put in good policing models that we know and understand, what we know we can be more effective. But currently, um, as we've heard, um, the UN in particular are the business class ticket out of conflict environments for overseas military. Um, the sooner they can get out, the better. And, and so we're left with some legacies that take more than a decade or so to resolve. Um, so our focus is on being really good role models in the UN in terms of police misconduct and focusing on that quality, capacity building and institutional building of those uh, host states that we deal with. Thanks very much. David, you have the final word. In the business of, um, of police assistance and innovation uh, anywhere, I think the mindset is capacity building. In other words, you focus on institutions and hope, us, and hope that righteous behavior will follow. And what Bob and I are, are suggesting in this monograph is to reverse that. That we want, rather than, than, than creating certain institutions and hoping that good things will occur, we invest millions in all of these, these, think, these institutions. And often good things don't happen. And the fact is that some very well-run in, uh, police institutions with lots of capacities can do frightful things. And so what we're now suggesting is why don't we turn this around and that rather than reforming institutions kind of on block first and then hoping for good behavior, let's focus on producing some, some, spec some specifiable, visible behaviors. Work on getting those behaviors and, you know, kind of one by one by one. And, and by succeeding with one behavior, and I cited you several from India and from, from Nigeria, but by succeeding in, in solving those particular problems, you will eventually begin to reform the institutions that are required to do that. So what we're suggesting is, 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 is don't, is, is go from behavior to institutions. In other words, from demonstrated success to the, to the reformation of the institutions which are, are, are implicated and responsible in that success. That's what we're suggesting. Invert the kind of mentality that we normally employ in this business. Now, let me say one last thing that I didn't say in, in, in the presentation. This does require that the regime, the political establishment, provide space for even that 
to happen. And we've got to keep stressing that. If, if, if the regime will not provide permission, it's hopeless. Now, I think there's another advantage then that comes from the, from the, from the disaggregate approach that Bob and I are advocating. And that is if you say to regime, look, we're, we're, we're not going to attack your whole system of interaction between corrupt cops and corrupt politicians. What we're going to do is to, is to work on a couple of problems which is causing alienation between the regime, as represented by the police, uh, and the public. In other words, if you can get them to buy off on some of what I consider high priority matters, like paying money when people need an FIR in India, I think they might accept that and find it at least difficult to take, uh, not to provide permission for doing that. On the other hand, if you're going to say we, we are going to create, we're going to work on institutions of leadership and oversight and pay and all of that all at once and, and, and in order to get a, a, a righteous police force, they're not going to give you permission for doing that. So I am suggesting that maybe an end run around the problem of political permission is to work small. Thanks very much. I want to remind everybody um, what we've been talking about um, today is, is a new report uh, on police corruption. It's available outside the door on the table, so please uh, grab a copy on your way out. I want to thank the panel uh, for a really uh, terrific presentation this morning. I'd like to ask for a round of applause. I'd like to thank all of you for coming this morning through the rain, and I have uh, one piece of good news for you. It's warmer outside uh, <laughs> the door of this building that is in this room. <laughs> and with that, uh, thank you very much, and, and goodbye.